Hello and welcome to a new episode of the West Asia Post, our show where we bring you your weekly dose of news coming out of West Asia, no doubt one of the most turbulent regions in the world. It seems that tensions between Tehran and Washington are not easing at all. The American National Security Advisor John Bolton accused Iran of being the mastermind of the attack that happened a while ago against Emirati and Saudi oil tankers of the Emirati coast. He said that this is one of the last warnings he is giving to Tehran. Tehran, on its end, says that they were not behind this attack and they are trying to dialogue and to talk with all the regional powers in order to avoid a conflict. Is it going to be possible to avoid a conflict and to keep talking between nations in an area, West Asia, where there is nothing worse than a new war? Tensions between Iran and the U.S. do not seem to be easing. There is uncertainty in West Asia, which could turn into a conflict any time. U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton traveled to the United Arab Emirates for talks on regional security with Washington's Gulf allies. In a press conference, Bolton said that the U.S. believes that the acts of sabotage against commercial vessels off the Emirati coast earlier this month were quote-unquote almost certainly from Iran. Bolton did not elaborate. He did not share any evidence to support his claim. Bringing back memories of the time before the invasion of Iraq, when the world was led into believing erroneously that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Back then, it was John Bolton who dismissed a 12,000-page report Baghdad had sent to the United Nations to show that it had no weapons of mass destruction. Bolton said at the time that the U.S. intelligence had hard evidence of Iraq buying uranium from Niger to build nuclear weapons, a finding which turned out to be based on forged documents. Iran has rejected Washington's accusations of pushing on nuclear military projects. The supreme leader of the country, Ayatollah Khomeini, joined the chorus too. نه بر خاطر تحریم بر خاطر مبنا مبنای فکری ما سلاحای کشتار جمعی از قبیل اتمی و شیمیایی اینها رو مجاز نمیکنه اینا حرام شرعن but washington keeps pursuing a dangerous strategy of maximum pressure trump even decided to send an additional 1500 us troops to west asia we want to have protection uh, the middle east we're going to be sending a relatively small number of troops, uh, mostly protective, and uh, some very talented people are going to the Middle East right now, and we'll see how, and we'll see what happens. For its part, Iran appears to be trying to defuse a possible escalation. Iran's deputy foreign minister traveled to Qatar and invited U.S. allies in the region to sign a non-aggression pact. Iran's Foreign Minister Javad Zarif paid a visit to Iraq, a country which offered to mediate in the crisis. Uh, we are clearly saying that we are against the unilateral measures taken by the U.S. We are completely against these instructions and orders to our neighbor Iran. We are standing by neighboring Iran in its position and God willing, we can play an intermediary role between the parties if asked by Iran. Uh, well, but Iran has made it clear that direct negotiations with the U.S. are not possible as long as Washington maintains economic sanctions on Iran. The country is facing the worst economic crisis in decades. Tehran asserted that it is ready to defend itself. Ma we will defend ourselves against any efforts for a war against Iran, whether it's a military or an economic one that would victimize the Iranian people and we will face it with strength and resistance. Despite the rhetoric, a war is not in the interest of the world, but a miscalculation could put the US into another expensive and deadly conflict with a country which has allies and military leverage on large parts of the region. Such a campaign would irreparably damage the image of US President Donald Trump, who ran on the promise of putting an end to America's never-ending wars. 
As for Iran, a conflict would devastate an already moribund economy, plummeting the country into a crisis from which it will not be able to recover immediately. It seems that Washington is slowly, slowly walking into war, whereas Iran is trying to avoid that. The only hope is that President Donald Trump and also the leadership in Iran do not really want to get involved into a war which could last many years and kill thousands of civilians. And the dialogue will, at the end of this very difficult story, prevail. But don't go anywhere. We have many more stories coming out. But, but, the first things first. Let's have a look together at the headlines we've been tracking during the week. A stream of explosions has hit the city of Kirkuk on the border between Iraq and the Kurdistan region. The Iraqi military says at least four people were killed and more than a dozen injured in what is widely believed to be an Islamic State terror attack. Kirkuk is an oil-rich city in northern Iraq, contested between its Arab and Kurdish population and has frequently been an Islamic State target in the past. During an emergency meeting of the Gulf Cooperation Council, the Arab League, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation and the Saudi King accused Iran of developing ballistic and nuclear missiles aimed at destabilizing West Asia. Riyadh and the UAE stressed the right to defend themselves from what has been defined as naked aggression by Iran. Qatar too was present for the first time after Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain and Egypt enforced a blockade against it in 2017. A high-profile U.S. delegation including the U.S. President's son-in-law and senior advisor Jared Kushner, the Middle East envoy Jason Greenblatt and the U.S. Special Representative for Iran, Brian Hook, touched base in Jerusalem to shore up the so-called deal of the century. The official visit comes amid a political crisis which forced Israel to call for snap polls in September. The oil-rich Kingdom of Kuwait will be among the first countries in the world to implement and operate nationwide a 5G network service which authorities believe will be fully functional by mid-June. The move will improve telecommunication in the Gulf country, bringing its internet speed to a new height. The Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has pledged many times to reconquer every inch of Syria. There is one last major rebel bastion in Syria. It's in the northwest and it's called Idlib. It's a huge province. There are three million civilians living there and an array of armed anti-Assad rebel groups. But it seems that time has come now for the Syrian forces and their Russian allies to launch a never-ending military campaign which could very much plunge the area in a terrible chaos. The United States already said that further military operation will prevent them to help the civilians living there. Is the Russian government stopping this? Is the United Nations Security Council stopping or are they paralyzed by the usual political infighting that we have witnessed in other major Syrian battles? The battle rages on in Syria's Idlib province the last bastion controlled by anti-Assad rebels. The latest round of fighting between Syrian government troops, their Russian allies and rebel forces has killed more than 20 civilians. The UK-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights says nine children were among them. They died after an airstrike targeted a busy street in Kafar Hala, right after Iftar, when people gathered to break the Ramadan's fasting. Idlib hosts several rebel groups, the most structured of which is the Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. It was once known as Jabhat al-Nusra and had ties to al-Qaeda. Other rebel groups have joined forces to fight under the banner of the Turkey-backed National Front of Liberation. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has repeatedly pledged to reconquer every inch of Syria. Although Russian President Vladimir Putin had recently said that an offensive against Idlib was not in the works, facts on the ground tell a different story. 
Clashes have been intense in the last month, killing at least two-thirds and 20 civilians and injuring more than 700. The United Nations says that 250,000 people have fled their homes for safety. The UN says that hospitals and health centers in the area have also been targeted. In total, the WHO and health actors have reported 20 attacks on these 18 facilities, almost one a day for the last three weeks. Some facilities have been hit twice. Other hospitals are closing for fear of being attacked. A total of 49 health facilities have partially or totally suspended activities. Between them, they provided an average each month of at least 171,000 medical outpatient consultations and 2,760 major surgical operations. They helped more than 1,400 women deliver their babies every month. Now they are not doing those things. The coordinates of hospitals in Idlib had been made available to both the Russian and the Syrian armies to avoid being hit. It's always very difficult without an independent investigation uh, to prove something was deliberate uh, when you're talking about a war zone and targeting of hospitals. Uh, the uh, very strong uh, belief of very many people on the Security Council uh, is that it is deliberate. Uh, and this is because there is a deconfliction mechanism uh, run by the UN, uh, but hospitals whose coordinates are in that deconfliction mechanism uh, have themselves been targeted. The Syrian government rejected all accusations, blaming civilian casualties on rebel forces. The Idlib campaign seems to follow a script similar to that of Eastern Ghouta, where Moscow and Damascus kept repeating that they were only targeting terrorists despite the shocking number of civilians killed in their military campaign. The terrorist organizations use hundreds of thousands of civilians as human shields. These organizations are involved in the most heinous crimes and disseminates death and destruction of civilians, schools and hospitals which have become military barracks and detention centers, torture centers for all those who reject their extremist ideologies. People of Idlib do not trust the international community. Idlib was one of the de-escalation zones in Syria and was under Russia-Turkey enforced ceasefire. But speaking at the UN Security Council, Moscow's tone was all but peaceful. Almost 3 million civilians live in and around the city of Idlib. Many of them have already been displaced several times during the eight-year war. Further military operations will overwhelm all ability to respond. Many of our humanitarian partners are part of the affected population and have themselves been displaced. As a result, in many areas of active hostilities, humanitarian operations have been suspended. If hostilities continue, all humanitarian agencies will be forced to halt their operations in the area, leaving the civilians at the mercy of war. What was possibly Benjamin Netanyahu's worst nightmare came true. He did not succeed in forming a coalition to govern Israel. And now, for the first time in the history of Israel, a designated prime minister has to call for snap polls, which will be held in September and will be very expensive for a country which focused very much on economic development. Benjamin Netanyahu worked quite literally till the very last minute to form a government. A few minutes before midnight on 29th May, the last day for him to form a coalition, he was still negotiating hard. 
He even proposed the left-wing Labour Party to join his right-wing coalition to get the numbers in place. But the negotiations collapsed on the demand for a bill to make military service mandatory for ultra-Orthodox Jewish men. Avigdor Lieberman, the leader of a right-wing party called Israel Our Home and a former defense minister in Netanyahu's cabinet, stood his ground, making his support conditional on adoption of a bill that would make military service mandatory for every Israeli, including the ultra-Orthodox. But the powerful religious parties have always opposed such a measure and stood their ground as well. It is perhaps the most heated topic in Israel's internal politics. Many citizens criticize Orthodox Jews for enjoying safety and support from the country without serving in its military, whereas all others have to mandatorily serve for three years. Finding a middle way proved to be impossible at the stroke of midnight. Netanyahu triggered the legal process to dissolve the federal legislature. Bill of the 21st, can I say dissolution in third reading? 74 in favor, 45 against. I determined that the bill was approved in three readings as required. It is the first time that a designated Prime Minister of Israel has failed to form a coalition government. Now the country could be heading for a snap poll, most likely in September, less than six months after the April vote. Netanyahu would have the option to walk to the president and give back his mandate, paving the way for someone else to try to form a coalition government. But he decided to take a gamble and drag the country into a snap poll, confident his party's better performance at the hustings. Netanyahu is taking no small risk in calling a snap poll. He had planned to propose a bill that would grant legal immunity to lawmakers and would have shielded himself from corruption accusations pending against him, an option which is now off the table. Some judged his move to be cynical and bad for public coffers. Holding a fresh election would cost the Israeli taxpayer about $200 million. Israeli business communities say that the transition period could cost the economy another $800 million. It seems that the world will also have to wait some more time to see the so-called deal of the century unveiled. Israel is a key part of the plan which, according to Washington, aims at solving the Palestine-Israel conflict. But without a prime minister, there is nothing they can do. They do not have a country of their own, therefore protecting the intangible aspects of their culture is the only way to determine the existence of the Palestinian people. And there is a seed bank in the West Bank which aims at preserving traditional crops that once upon a time were grown by Palestinian farmers. Palestine has fertile soil. Agriculture forms the spine of the Palestinian economy, giving its people a way to sustain themselves in the middle of political and economic crises. But more and more Palestinians, especially those living in big cities, are resorting to the markets for their food and vegetables. They often buy goods coming directly from Israel, fueling the economy of a state many of them rival. Vivian Sanso, a scholar based in the town of Beit Sahur, near the city of Bethlehem, has decided to build a seed library where she collects generations-old varieties of plants which risk extinction. The goal of this project is to revive our Palestinian heritage by cultivating traditional crops which are at risk of going extinct and also to get back to live our history and eat from it rather than just talk about it as something from the past. Mrs. Sansur also aims to bring back food which was once a staple of Palestinian cuisine. The Seeds Library is a journey I started to revive heirloom plants whose taste I missed in the Palestinian kitchen and which could go extinct, like the watermelon and the heirloom cucumber, etc. Sansur also works elbow to elbow with Palestinian farmers, convincing them to sow seeds originally from this land, which are naturally more resistant. 
It's a very nice project as it encourages residents, especially those who have small gardens, so that they can reach self-sufficiency. It is particularly helpful when planting crops such as tomatoes, zucchini, pumpkins and other beans, all from their heirloom seeds. Owing to their recent history, the attacks against their cultural identity and the lack of an independent state, some Palestinians take their heritage and history very seriously. For them, preserving it is a mission. I can't describe my feeling, how important and great it is to feel that I have the responsibility and be the reason of reviving these seeds and introduce them to the people and farmers. This feeling gives me responsibility and gives me hope for a better future if we can continue to use these seeds. An attachment to the roots does not fade with distance. Palestinians living abroad too showed enthusiasm for the seed bank. Among the most interesting thing the Seeds Library achieved is that I began to receive a lot of letters from Palestinians in the diaspora from all over the world who want to cultivate these seeds and plant their history. They want to connect with who they are. In Jordan, there is a huge number of Syrian refugees. And many of them now have been living in this very country where I am right now for five, six, even seven years. So basically, it has become for many children their second home. Many of them do not even remember how Syria was before the war and they think that Jordan is their house. But the problem is that their parents struggle to find a job because they are not allowed to work in every field. But some of them, some Syrians from the province of Aleppo, started doing what they knew the best. Jordan is home to more than a million Syrian refugees. More than 80,000 of them live in the huge Zatari camp. But some others live in the informal camps far from the reach of the humanitarian agencies. Very few have managed to settle in Jordanian cities and find a job. But the majority of Syrian refugees still depend on aid for their livelihood. In order to facilitate their integration, the government of Jordan started allowing Syrians from last year to operate small businesses, in particular family mills. And it was then that Ahmed Kassar, originally from Aleppo, figured out a way to make a living. After saving some money, he went back to doing what he knew best, producing the famous Aleppo soap. I had my own factory in Syria, and I also had a business license, my own shop and customers. I didn't have any difficulties in funding a life, and I enjoyed my life. I could conduct import and export, and I did a lot of things. But here, everything is so different. I'm only a refugee here. He does not have a factory in Jordan, so he produces soap with very basic tools. Olive oil soap is an established tradition in Aleppo. It is very famous in West Asia, where many appreciate its natural ingredients. Ahmed owned several shops back in Syria, but everything he had was destroyed by the hostilities. Being a refugee is not a choice. One would never leave the comforts of their home and country if it was not a life-saving necessity. Like many other Syrian refugees, Ahmed dreams to go back home too. But he knows that he might have to wait long and waste the chance to settle down in Jordan. If the situation in Syria is stable, maybe I would go back to Syria and start from the very beginning. Or maybe I can get an opportunity of building a factory here. That would be nice, but that needs a lot of money. But the reality is that I don't have the money. Syrian refugees in Jordan are going back to their cities in much smaller numbers than expected. The border is open and the southern Syrian provinces where they came from have not witnessed war in almost a year. But many of them say that there is no work in Syria right now and fear violence and revenge by Syrian forces. The UN recently denounced that Syrian troops arrested at least 380 people and killed 11 in quote-unquote targeted killings in the southern Syrian city of Dera, one of the main places of origin of the Syrian refugees based in Jordan. No wonder many Syrians who might have taken part in the protests back in 2011 or 2012, even as simple supporters, are now afraid to go back. We have come to the end of this episode of the West Asia Post. That's all we have for you for today. But remember that we are on air every week and we are always happy that you take your time to take a journey with us throughout, no doubt, a very turbulent region, but also a marvellous region in the world. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.